Uh, we had uh, a thank you track a while back. Does anybody happen to have any at home? A leftover thank you track? You did find one? Okay. Did it have on there where we got a print? Okay. How many do you have? 20? If I could get two, that way I can try to scan it and see what we can do with that. Okay, Exodus 33 and then Proverbs 4. Okay, not that I'm apologizing preaching the Bible, but this topic this morning is a broccoli and salad topic with no dressing. Sorry, sorry. And so, but it's, def- it's necessary, and uh, especially it helps us analyze society. Exodus 33. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and pray first. Lord, I do ask you to help us understand your words. I do pray that you'd help us to see what's happening <clears throat> as far as a society or nation's going, but then also this has come into the church. And I pray that you'd help us to be faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Exodus 33 is the, uh, you're going to call it first revival or first spanking by God with Israel where they, they get right after their first backsliding. So in Exodus 20, God makes this agreement with Israel about some special favors they're going to get if they obey God and some uh, curses if they don't obey God. So it's how God is treating a specific nation. He chose Israel to be the first one to try this experiment with. And so in chapter 20, he gave them the Ten Commandments. So that's the basic uh, agreement. And then you get all the details. We go through Leviticus. And so here, 12 chapters later, as, as their, um, not mediator or negotiator, I guess you can call Moses a negotiator between God and Israel. After he was gone for 40 days, and so they got impatient, and um, so they had a dance. They had a mess. So then after the mess, in chapter 33, you'll see their reaction. Chapter 33, verse 1, 2, and 3. Uh, at, uh, at the end of verse 3, or, or about two-thirds into it, you'll see that God just lays it out. He says, Thou art a stiff-necked people, lest they consume thee in a way. So it was, he was, God was ready to blow them off the map. <clears throat> so when they saw that, when they heard that, this is after they saw the thunders and lightnings and all the scary stuff, it got their attention. So it says in verse 4, When the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned. <clears throat> good, that's good. And no man did put on his ornaments. Now, I, I thought that's kind of weird. He didn't put his ornaments on. Okay? And so then it, it, it's, this doesn't say it once. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore, now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments. By the Mount Horeb. Okay, that's Sinai. It's got two names, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. But I thought it was interesting. Three times he mentioned the word ornaments in that context. Okay, those ornaments are ornaments that glorify the flesh. The one that would glorify God is in Proverbs chapter 4 passage. In verse 7, it says... Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote thee. She shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her. She shall give to thine head an ornament of grace. A crown of glory shall she deliver to thee. So we have two separate ornaments, two different types. And the ornaments that Exodus 33 talks about are things that we put on our body to draw attention to our body, okay? And the ornaments of grace is what the Lord would said, that's what get, will get my attention, okay? So we have two separate things. Now, as I go through this, uh, you know, I, I don't know how graphic I'm going to be, and I would have never thought 30 years ago when I started preaching, I have to preach like this. 
But uh, we are living in a perverted society. And, of course, the temple prostitute will be on full display at halftime during the toilet bowl. Okay? It will be full supply. She is a prostitute. Uh, Madonna, they had her in the past. I don't know who they got time, this time. But it's going to be a temple prostitute. And they are going to worship their God. They're going to display their great feast to their God at halftime. Now, if you want to take time and watch it, I want to take time and watch it. If you doubt what I'm saying, that it is a worship service, go back on YouTube and go to the past ones and just watch the brief thing as somebody's commenting on it to, dis- to show it. If you don't see it, I mean, you, you're not, you don't have much discretion. But if you need somebody to point it out, okay, do that. But uh, this is the Exodus 32. Okay, so in Exodus 33 would be their first... Revival, I guess you could say. Exodus 32 would be their first backsliding. So we're going to skim through Exodus 32, not just read it per se, you know, per se throw in a few ideas. So if you've got your speed reading skills, and the way you do that is you take a pen or your finger, and then you just come straight down the page as your eyes use your peripheral vision, and you'll see... The storyline. Okay, so Moses is on top of the mountain with God, 40 days, 40 nights. He's been fellowshipping with God, and people got all tired of it. So in chapter 32, verse 2, they went to Aaron. He was the second guy in command. They said, hey, I, what happened to Moses? He's, I, he's probably gone. So let's go back to the gods that we had in Egypt. So verse 2, Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, of your daughters, and bring them unto me. So there's the ornaments. Okay, so at this time, they limited themselves to the earrings. We'll get to all the others in Isaiah 3. Okay, so they got all the gold, and all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it with a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel. So now he's violated the first two commandments of the ten. Okay, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast of the Lord. So, okay. So they got out of Egypt, and now they're going to have a feast. But this is going to be a Jewish or Christian feast, let's put it in that light. And so they're going to have a party. And so who should we have sing at the party? Well, I know back in Egypt we had Madonna, but, you know, we're above that now. We're not pagan, so let's try a Christian Madonna. Got to be a Christian Madonna that's going to have her contemporary music. Let's try Sandy Patty or Amy Grant or something. I'm really dating myself because that's going back several years. I don't, I'm, I don't know the Christian contemporary artist now, uh, so I'm going back a few years. So we'll have them come in. So they get the party going. They've got the golden calf, and they're dancing and everything. And the Lord in heaven, verse 7, says to Moses, uh, we got a mess going on down there. Those people, I'm going to go down and just kill them. I'm sick of it. And Moses said, Why? He said, well, wait till you go see it. And so Moses talks him out of it. Verse 14, God repented. God said, okay, I won't kill him. I was going to kill him and then start all over again with you. But okay, I won't kill him. So then he says, Moses, you go look. So Moses comes down, verse 15. And 16, he had the tent, the, the tablets in his arms. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people, verse 17, so Joshua was kind of halfway up the mountain. You talk about the one that's getting bored is Joshua, just waiting. I don't know if he stayed there that whole time. Okay, and as they're coming down, they hear a noise. They hear loud noise. There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. Okay, so it's the... Of course, it's not the heavy metal, uh, you know, Motley crew. It's the Petra crew. Because they're Christians now. And they're yelling and screaming and jumping around and dancing. Verse 19. And Moses came down and it says he, he threw all the Ten Commandments down. So they all got broken at this dance. He took the calf which they had made and burnt it in fire and, and ground it into powder 
and made the first Shackley drink. I'm really dating myself. When mom got into Shackley, the first drink I had, man, it tastes like sand. <laughs> okay, but okay, so he made him drink it. And then uh, you'll see in verse 25, and when Moses saw the people were naked. Now that's not nude. Naked in the Bible doesn't necessarily mean nude. Okay, so they're jumping up and down, dancing, you know, in the, in the name of the Lord, let them. And, uh, and God is sick of this, tired of this. And verse 26, 27, Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? And a bunch of these guys said, Levi, children of Levi. We are. And he said, okay, go out and kill them. And they killed the entire crew at the halftime show of the Super Bowl. 3,000. Kill them all. And then in chapter 33 is the where God dealt with the rest of them. And I thought it was very interesting that they took their ornaments off. Okay, so this is about 1400 B.C., 1450 B.C. Fast forward 700 years later, Isaiah chapter 3. Obviously, with the evolutionary theory and everything's getting better, <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 3, verse 16, this is what I call when people look like Christmas trees. When people look like <clears throat> Christmas trees, society is about gone. Okay, and so chapter 3, verse 16, now Isaiah is prophesying to the southern tribes, Judah, <clears throat> At the time that the, right prior to the northern tribes being conquered. So he's kind of, he's given warning to both sides. And in chapter 3, verse 16, he is describing the, Christ, the people of his day, the Christmas trees walking around. Verse 16, moreover the Lord saith, <clears throat> because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walked with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. Okay, now there's a tribe in Africa where they thought a woman looked beautiful if her head, your neck was real tall, you know, where they'd put the rings in her and make their neck taller and taller and taller, which I don't know if the chiropractors of that age didn't like that idea. Maybe they thought they evolved from giraffes. I have no idea. But they thought that was beautiful. Okay, and then some societies, they have the women that want small feet in the Oriental cultures. And uh, Josh, they'll, they'll see some of those Chinese ladies where... They're up in years and her feet are like that long. And man, they just, they just can't even walk because of that. Okay, so you can see here that they're haughty, stretch forth necks, wanton eyes. Wanton is a legal term. Like malicious, purposeful, wanton. Wanton is deliberate. They have wanton eyes, but they're deliberate eyes, but they're eyes that are sexually immodest is what the wanton eyes are. And then you see it walking and mincing as they go. You know, like, uh, what are they, the models. You know, all that stuff. Showing off their body. And making a ting tinkling with their feet. So they got an ankle bracelet with a thing in there, like a goat, you know, so you know where the goats are at. Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. Well, it's like he said, you've been teasing guys with it. I'm just going to show it. And it says, in the day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet. And their culls and their round tires like the moon. Sounds like a car. And the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers. Really sounds like a car. But these are all trinkets that they put on their body. And the bonnet, or the bonnets. Now, a bonnet, you know, of course, we know the, the head thing. In, in Australia, Heidi's car, there was a homeless nutcase that took a shopping cart and threw on top of her car and smashed the hood in. Scratched a little bit of the fenders, but I saw the hood I, when we were out there a couple times ago. I said, maybe we call a junkyard, I can find a hood. Hopefully, I can find one the exact same color and just trade it. <laughs> And so I called the first junkyard. I said, I'm looking for a hood for a car. And they said, a what? I said, a hood. You know, it's right above the engine, the metal part. And they said, oh, the bonnet. Bonnet? Well, they call that a bonnet. 
So then from thereafter, I called several. I'm looking for a bonnet, you know, and I happened to find the exact color, the same thing. All I had to do was take four bolts off, you know, took the hood off, put the new one on, gave the hood back to the junkyard. worked perfect. Man, couldn't ask for better. <laughs> okay, but that's what's called a bonnet. In the Bible, it's something they put on their body. And then it says the ornaments of the legs. So they've got stuff coming up the leg and the headbands and the tablets. See, they had iPads back in those days. And the earrings. And the rings and the nose jewels. They got them all in the nose. And the lips. And the changeable suits of apparel. And the mantles and the wimples. Wimples, that's a sissy acne. Okay, the wimples and the crisping pins. And the glass, or the glasses and the fine linen and the hoods and the veil. So you see, they had uh, Trayvon Martin back in those days, the hoods. Okay, and the veils, and it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. Yeah, that's right. And instead of a girdle, a rent, and instead of a well-set hair, baldness. And instead of a, of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth, and burning instead of beauty, the men shall fall by the sword, their, and thy mighty in the war, and her gates shall lament and mourn, and she, shall, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. Bad news there. Bad. But notice the idea is the ornaments. If it takes a person more than an hour in front of the vanity to get ready, somebody is vain. It's called a vanity for a reason. Okay, now any guy knows you can get up in five minutes, you can be out the door. Forget about combing the hair, just put on a hat. Okay, but I'll just give you some thoughts about this this morning. And the first thought is this. Excessive adornment of the flesh is evidence of the influence of unclean spirits. Now, I'm dealing with a society. And, of course, I'm not dealing with maybe who somebody just got saved and is coming through, you know, just growing in grace, depending on what great uh, direction you're going. But this excessive adornment of the flesh is evidence of the influence of unclean spirits. It's a look-at-me attitude. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Can't you see me? Look at this. I've got my hair this way and this way. Oh, and I say you wanted to be a unicorn when you grew up. And then you look at them and they say, what you looking at? I'm saying, you, of course, isn't that what you want? You know? And the idea is it's all look at me attitude. And if we don't give them the praise they want, then it becomes a woe is me attitude. They're easily offended. Persecution complex. I've been the one that's been hurt. No, the... <laughs> Welcome to life. Okay, but this is the idea. Uh, if you're in Isaiah, go to Ezekiel 23, verse 40. Ezekiel 23 is, our, is about two girls who are infatuated with soldiers. When the Navy came in port, they were definitely out at the, at the thing, attracting the guys. How were they attracting them? Ezekiel 23, verse 40. And furthermore, ye, that ye have sent for men to come from far... Unto whom a messenger was sent, and lo, they came, for whom thou didst wash thyself, painest thy eyes, and deckest thyself with ornaments. What's the intent of that? Next verse, and sat us upon a stately bed. That's the intent. So, what is that evidence of? It's evidence of a selfish heart, a wicked heart, and it's an evidence of unclean spirits. Now, how, why do I say unclean spirits? Go to Mark 5, and we'll look at the maniac of Gadara, who's becoming more and more popular. And the maniac of Gadara, you'll find in Hollywood. In the music industry, they like maniacs of Gadara's. Now, they'll dress them up and make them look better than they are, but Mark 5 is a guy. There's two guys. Mark just focuses on one of them. And it says in verse 1, And they came over unto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. Okay, now it's an singular unclean spirit, but that unclean spirit is bipolar or 2,000 polar, it's multi-personalities, because that's about 2,000 devils within one unclean spirit. This guy is infested. This guy's out there. <clears throat> you're seeing this guy more and more now. Every, you, know, you get out of the streets, you'll, you'll talk to this guy. 
<clears throat> I, I expect to see several of these down in Memphis in May when I go down there. Uh, verse 3, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. So he's super strong, but yet you can't, he can't love him, you can't scare him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. So we call these cutters. That's evidence of unclean spirits, cutters. Or headbangers. Headbangers, not a rock group. Headbangers, a kid who will put his, head, put his back against the wall and then bang his head on the wall. And I mean, hit it hard. That's a headbanger. That's devils. That's, that is evidence of unclean spirits. Somebody's infested. Now, Luke writes about this guy. He says, this guy wear no clothes. Mark doesn't mention that, but he does mention verse 15. And they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with devils and had the legion sitting and clothed. Now he's got his clothes on, or at least the appropriate amount. So that, that's where you get the idea that a society that is showing more flesh and they look like Christmas trees is a society that's infested with devils. Okay, that's where that, the idea of that comes from. You, because the more flesh that you show, the more flesh is sown. And Galatians says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. We reap to our flesh, we sow to our flesh, we will reap corruption. So that's the idea there. The more the flesh is shown, the more unclean spirits are known. Because of the evidence of the flesh. Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Paul said in Romans 13, make no provision for the flesh. Provision. Vision. That's why television is so powerful. The vision of the flesh. Now, a person may not, you know, maybe you'll try to keep your young, young men, boys, around modest dressed girls, but then you parade the Hollywood prostitutes in front of the telly on them. What difference does it make? So the maniac of Gadara is evidence. He, he, he used to be an inner city thing where maybe guys on drugs or something like that. But now you see him in the country because Hollywood is brought to the country through the TV. So the idea here is excessive adornment of flesh is evidence of the un influence of unclean spirits. Second thought is this. Appropriate apparel should glorify God. Okay, 1 Corinthians 10.31, I dare say that whether, you, whether therefore you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. Okay, hopefully that's our intent. Now, the world knows, the world knows that special dress or uniforms are necessary for certain occasions. Okay, in the military you have the fatigues, but then you got your dress, fancy dress uniform, depending on the occasion. Okay, and so when you're out in public, dress accordingly to the occasion. Okay, dress appropriately for a job interview. If you would, look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, these passages are about the only ones that fundamental Baptists preach about. That's about the only ones they know. And, but yet we need to recognize these things and then analyze them and, and figure it out what would please the Lord in our dress. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness. Notice the attitude is more important. Okay, the general idea is however a girl or however a person is attracted to another individual, if they're attracted according to the appearance of the flesh, that is how you have to maintain the attraction. When the flesh is youthful and attractive, but when it gets old and starts dragging, sagging, bagging, the person's going to look for something youthful. But if you attract them through your countenance, through your inner spirit, that gets better. The flesh obviously gets worse. 
And you do all you can for them, try to keep it from getting worse. Okay, and so that's the idea. Think about these things logically. With shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Now, why does he address the women like this, specifically? It's because men get aroused by their eyes. Women get aroused by touch, generally speaking. But now women are getting so lustful nowadays, they're getting perverted. You know a society's bad when women are bad. Okay, society as a whole, generally you have wicked men. Okay, just generally, that's just how it is. But when society have wicked women, you have a bad society. When women can cuss to make a sailor blush, that is a wicked woman. And Hollywood is attracted to wicked women. Okay, that's who they're parading. That's who they parade. They don't parade. Okay, Mary Tyler Moore died. Which Mary Tyler is Hollywood talking about? The... Dick Van Dyke one, where she was a house homemaker, or the career Mary Tyler who had her own, that's the one they're pushing. Why? Because that's their agenda. That's their agenda. So in 1 Timothy, the word is modest, apparel. Now that's the only time that word's found in the Bible. So how do we define it? Philippians 4, 5, so let your moderation be known. So modest apparel is an avoidance of extremes. Now, we know the fundamentalists, this is a big deal where they'll have all these rules and regulations, which I'm not opposed to. But the problem is that doesn't make a person spiritual and the flesh can work around that. They can still have a skirt, but when that skirt is tight fitting, coming down, you can see the curves. It may go to her knee, but she's still drawing attention. It's the matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. Modest is an uh, unassuming. A modest individual doesn't want attention. So modest apparel is an apparel that doesn't draw attention to it. That's what modest apparel. What is it? It's loose. It's loose apparel. Okay, and this is the thing. It is to be done decently and in order. Now, uniform, even the world knows you have certain dress standards. Uniforms. Some, you know, companies have uniforms. In Australia, a little Lukey's in a public school in a little town there. He's got a uniform. The public schools there have uniform. Personally, I like the idea. It saves on all the fads and fashions. Okay? And so, you just, everybody's got the same thing. Which is not a bad idea. But, boy, America, that would really gripe about that one. Okay, but again, on the fundamentalist side, they always harp on short hair on men, but they don't talk about long hair on women. It's in the same passage. What are they trying to do? They're trying to present something that looks good outwardly, but anybody knows in the fundamental Baptist movement, the sexual scandals are disgusting. I mean, I almost got thrown in the middle of some of that stuff, unbeknownst to me. Where the Catholics are going after their own gender, well, the fundamental Baptists almost have this mentality where we keep them pure so we can keep them for ourselves. All I'm saying is that it's a matter of the heart. That is the key. And the key in dress is loose. Where do we draw the line? Okay, 1 Peter chapter 3. A lot of times people say, where's the line? Where's the line? Well, the reason why a person wants to draw, where the, know where the line is because they want to get as close to it as possible. There's a guy that was trying to get, uh, he was trying to get a, a driver of a carriage. And it was up a steep uh, mountain cliff. And the first guy he interviewed, he said, I want, to see, I want to see how good you are. How good are you such a driver of a carriage? How, could, how close do you get to the edge before you go over? He said, well, I could probably get 12 inches. Oh, the second guy, he interviewed him, and he said, well, he said, the last guy told me, oh, man, I'm better than I can get six inches. And the third guy, he said, how close can you get to the edge? He said, close to the edge, I'm staying as far away as possible. He said, hired. Why do you want the guy close to the edge? 
First Peter chapter three. Now, our hol- the holiness people will take this one to extreme. First Peter three. You can see again he's addressing females. Verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of the hair or of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel. Now, the holiness people are going to really accent that, and they say no jewelry, no gold, no cutting your hair. And so they got such long hair, they got to wrap it around so a bird can have a whole nest in there. Okay, but if you go to a holiness convention, you'll see their skirts as tight as could be because they're showing it off. So it's not a matter of that. The issue is, verse 4, let the hidden man of the heart, in that which is corruptible, even the ornament, there's that word, of a meek and quiet spirit, that one is one that continually can improve. That should be our draw. Now, when the heart is right, the address is appropriate. In Genesis chapter 3, when man sinned, recognized his sin, God killed the lamb and put some clothes on them. That makes us different than animals. Animals don't wear clothes unless you get that one of them little sissy dogs, but that's somebody putting clothes on that dog. That's not natural for that dog. Okay, and so... But people who have seared conscience and perverted eyes like to reveal more and more of their flesh. Why? Drawing attention to themselves. If there's going to be a rule, if you need an absolute rule, the rule is loose apparel. That's the rule. Loose apparel that doesn't show the curves. We'll get real precise here. If the undergarment can be seen, the line can be seen, you're talking advertisements. And don't complain when a guy whistles or a girl whistles because you've advertised. You say, that's not my intention. It don't matter. You've advertised. Now, if the clothes looked like somebody took a spray can and painted on them, And some of these women, they have to have a whole gallon of it. When it takes a gallon to paint, that is gross. My grandpa would say it looks like two pigs fighting in a sack. I mean, that's just disgusting. Okay, but the idea is that when it's tight, you're advertising. I don't want my wife advertising. If she would happen to me, I say, "Honey, am I? Are you looking for something else?" Okay, and ladies, if you want to be treated like a lady and treated classy, dress like one. Generally, that's what will happen. Generally speaking, I know we're getting a perverted age where you really gotta you gotta go to extremes, as far as way far away from the line. If it's doubtful, it's dirty. Young ladies, you don't understand. I know you don't understand this. I know you don't get it. Go to a mall, not to shop. Go to the mall to do what my dad and I would do, is sit and watch people. Dad would usually take a nap. Okay, but watch people. Watch guys and their eyes, what they look at. Look at the girl, see how she's dressed, watch his eyes. And he'll be looking at a side of beef. That's not how you want to dress. Ask advice of godly parents or a godly lady. Okay? And, you know, basically, look at American history. Okay? Go back to American history. Look at America as a spiritual nation. Back in the 1700s. How did people dress in the 1700s? I mean, in the early 1900s, the women's bathing suits are more than what people wear nowadays. But go back to the 1700s, and you'll see men and women who had clothes that was loose, flowing, big clothes, five-man tent, make them look real nice. I remember going to, like, some place where you had these, where you could put these old clothes on, take a picture, you know, 
young teenage girl, her little brother. I'm, I, I saw them when they were behind taking the picture. I said, man, they look so nice. Then he walked out from behind. And I said, oh, gag, go back in behind the picture. Disgusting. Okay, but back in the 1700s, okay, as time goes on in America, in the 1850s, a movement began to arise. 1850s got a bunch of bad things taken on in America. Mormonism, J.W., uh, the Uncivil War. I mean, you've got um, uh, the revised versions coming through there. And then we had a movement called a women's suffrage movement. It's about women's voting and all that stuff. Well, that was the forerunner of the feminist movement. The women's suffrage movement, what did they do? They introduced trousers to women. They introduced the ideas of trousers. Now, they were loose-fitting and everything, but people called them transvestites. Now, that was in the 1850s and 60s and 70s. Now, people don't look at it that way nowadays. But I'm telling you, that's how it started. And then you get to World War II, and women start going to the factories. Well, they needed to be modest in their apparel, so they would wear their husband's pants. Now, if she's wearing his pants, they're obviously loose. Okay? But the idea was modesty. The idea wasn't to draw attention to herself. Now, since then, in the 50s and the wonderful 60s, things got tighter and tighter and tighter and skimpier and skimpier and skimpier. And then look at the divorce rates. And look at the rates where the opposite sex doesn't look as inviting anymore. And now they're looking at their own. And don't let anybody take pictures of your kids and put them on the Internet. Because those pictures become big money in Hollywood. To sell to pedophiles. Why do you want your pictures? You know, they can take them off Facebook. Yeah, that's a big market. That's a big market. Get in a pizza gate and you'll learn some about that stuff if you want to. But the clothes that began to get tighter and tighter are tighter and tighter for a reason. What's the reason? Proverbs chapter 7 calls it the attire of a harlot. They're advertising. Now, a prostitute gets paid for doing it. But you go to the public school, you can't really say they're prostitutes. Because they're advertising for nothing. That takes it a whole different level. Now, I'm not saying you should call a person that. I don't believe you should call a person. But they're wearing the clothes of that. They're advertising it. Now, is it not true that the world has high standards for us believers? Don't they have higher standards than we do? What is the standards of the world when you go to a bathroom? Look at this symbol. The world says men stand like this in pants and women stand like this in a dress. That's what the world says. Now, if you don't uh, comply, if you don't want to go that far, at least wear loose. Keep it loose. Why would you be advertising, especially in church? Okay, and that's that's the thing is, today they're going to have to have a third bathroom with a question mark. <clears throat> the Boys and Girl Scouts are going to have to change their name to the Confused Scouts. Because now all are invited. Dogs, cats, who name it, are going to head that way. Why? Our society is falling apart. It's a mess. Now, who dictates the closing fads? Hollywood does. I remember Grandpa, Grandpa, in the 1960s, thin ties were in. In the 1960s, 70s, the the bigger ties came in. And my Grandpa Hoffman, my dad's dad, in 1960s, he said, I kept this from the 50s. It was in the 50s. I got it back again. (laughs) The idea is forget the fads and fashions. Dress classy with the classics. And And people will generally... Treat a person according to how they appear. Okay, the key in apparel, especially for females, is loose. But nowadays, fellas, you want an eerie feeling? Get whistled at by a guy. Okay, and 
Where's the borderline? Okay, if a person really wants to know the border, God does give it for us. Isaiah 47. <clears throat> so we can see it. Isaiah 47. <clears throat> If a person desires to be a positive and Christ-like influence, a leader, you, will mu you must sacrifice and live above the norm without a holier-than-thou attitude. Isaiah 47, okay, and so he's the same writer of Isaiah 3 where he talked about people looking like Christmas trees. 47 verse 1, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. So that's good. Virgin daughter, sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Uh-oh, something's happened. <clears throat> she lost something. What's happening? Take the millstones and grind meal. Uncover thy locks. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Where's the dividing line? It's the knee. That's the dividing line. Right there. He said above the knee is nakedness. It's not nude. Nude is Ponderosa Sun Club. Okay? But in the Bible, the dividing line is right there. So, everything loose, right there. And anybody knows that when a woman's got a skirt and that thing comes up here, she's advertising. It is an advertisement. And so the thing is, what is our intentions of our heart? That's the bottom line issue. If our heart is intending to please God, and if we happen to have something that's not right, the Spirit of God will say, hey, who are you trying to please here? That's the bottom line. The bottom line is, you know what self is? Spell it backwards. F-L-E-S, throw in an H and you got flesh. That's all that it is. Is a person trying to draw attention to themselves, or are we remembering that we are representative of God Almighty? And, of course, you know me, I'm not saying you've got to wear a suit and tie anymore, because as soon as I'm done, I'm taking the tie off. And the guy who invented ties, I hope he went to hell. <laughs> but still, the idea, the idea is casual dress or any loose fitting is the key. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us to... Uh, be good representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I do pray and ask that you'd help us to, as, as uh, fathers or men, that we might gently guide and direct the young men and the ladies. And Lord, I pray that the ladies would recognize that what we should be doing is to have a meek and quiet spirit, a gentle spirit, a spirit that pleases the Lord, that our countenance, our facial countenance, and our inner man would be what hopefully would draw a young man. And then that can get better. If a person is insecure enough to try to use their body to draw, then that's not the method. And I pray you'd help us to be faithful to you, help us to represent you in a proper way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We'll be dismissed with that uplifting message. <laughs>